Right, yeah. Like, you, they can tell when you're using that. And I don't think... <laughs> Like, people don't like that though. People don't like feeling dumb. Like, wait, I don't know what this means. Like, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Young Eager Writers podcast. My name is Desiree Brown. And my name is Michael Evans. Feel specifically obligated to you know, make some super exciting content specifically because I feel bad for um, Mel. By the way, I feel like we should start talking about our team. Yes, you get to see uh, my beautiful face and Michael's beautiful face, but we actually have many other people working on this podcast, one of which is Mel. Mel is always in the room with us. Um, You just cannot see her. Um, But yeah, she does all of the editing and she has to listen to our voices every week. So (laughs) multiple days a week. So we're going to make it right. Yeah. (laughs) We're going to make some super um, fun content for her so she can, you know, actually enjoy the editing process. So, so yeah. Um, Before we jump into any kind of like, you know, what we're doing this episode, any updates, what's going on with you, Michael? Like we see each other every week, but I feel like now we're like regulars. Like I got to I got to get an update now. We're, 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 we're regulars at the, the writing bar. This is our young writing bar. Um, no alcohol. Um, we, we're big on chocolate milk, yeah. water, and, and some seltzer for feeling really, really crazy. No, no, um, <laughs> I've been good. You know, I've been working on but mainly like two un, writing tangential projects, but I, I like it. I, I'm working on a technology platform related to um, fiction. It's like a Patreon fiction author platform. And I've been working on a nonfiction book related to the creator economy. So I've been uh, busy with that, have not been writing much fiction, but I'm completely okay with that at this point in my life. You know, you strike me as the type of person who would be really good at writing nonfiction. Do you, do you feel comfortable in that genre? I like it a lot. Um, yeah. I haven't been in preparation maybe for this book because I've been thinking about it slash researching it for maybe about a year now, I've written about like maybe 20 or 25,000 words of like newsletter content. That was like just my thoughts on the creator economy and technology and stuff. So I was just practicing it and I never released any of it, but I think after doing that, I felt like I can, I can do this kind of whole business writing thing. Um, and business writing is fun because, um, there's a lot of different things you can do with it in terms of how you put it out into the world and um, how you connect with people, the kind of the revenue streams that can come in that I think fiction's going to have a lot more opportunities open up. That's a lot of what the book's about, but um, it already is a pretty cool world for like nonfiction authors in terms of just um, all the different things you can do with with a book when your audience expectation isn't different, but the business models around it are. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, do you specifically, maybe this is an ignorant question, um, do you have things specifically in there for like, not young writers, but like people who are just now starting to write in this world, in this industry, um, in a world where we're seeing so much technology? I'm, I'm curious, is that like the main focus of the book? Is there like a certain section there? I mean, the book is called uh, Creator Economy for Authors. So the entire book is about um, where I think the future of fiction is headed and already really is in many ways, which is all about the community coming first and being the kind of central node and building a business and story world around that. So I think for, for anyone, like it's just a way to think about how to grow a sustainable career as a writer that's completely different from the traditional publishing model or what a lot of people think of any publishing today. But I think it's where it's all headed. Yeah. I, yeah. I, including myself, I know so many people who would be interested in reading that <laughs> and and learning more. Because I think that like that's one of the things that self-published authors, like they they really have to not only just do the writing portion, which is a very difficult portion to do, but on top of that, have to also understand the industry. Like when you go through more traditional publishing you know, you have someone who's standing over you saying, these are the things that are going to sell. These are the things that you have to do. Um, you know, indie publishing, 
you're a little bit more on your own. And so I, I just know so many people who would love to actually have that kind of information for, for people who want to publish, um, in any way, uh, any form, because that stuff's important. And it's, it's, I mean, it's not something I think like everyone should make their top priority. Like you got to make sure you write a good story at the end of the day, no matter what. But when it comes to, you know, like, what is this inter- industry going to look like? Like the, what we've learned maybe isn't m- up to date, I should say. You know, I agree. I think um, one thing I will say, though, on the advice about like writing just a good story and, and that'll be it. I, I think that that I wish it worked that way. But it doesn't. And, it, and it's not because that good stories don't make it and that it is all just luck. It's not that either. But I think that if, if publishers knew how to spot a good story, and in, in their definition, a good story is typically one that sells well, then they would only publish good stories. But they publish a lot of stories that don't do well. So are those stories good? Or not. And and we can, that's an open question really that's subjective. But I think that it is true that some stories find an audience better than others. And how I would encourage writers to actually think about it is reverse engineer the process and think about what community that you want to be creating, um, what version of yourself or your character or your world do you want to be connecting with out there? Because even if a publisher isn't doing um, the marketing for you're an indie published or it's reverse. I think we're moving into a world where more and more readers want to have relationships with the author or with the character, with the world that they're building and the digital environment we live in enables those connections to be deeper. And there's no one who's really going to be able to do that better than an author's vision for that whole community. So mm-hmm. if you don't have a vision for it, it's going to be very difficult. I think to, to make it in publishing, um, 30, years from now, like this long tail of having a career. And I think it's something too, that it takes off like the marketing speak out of it. The idea of like, you have to run your own ads if you're an indie author or the idea that if I'm not getting premium placement in every bookstore in the country, I'm not going to make it. it. You can really focus on, you know, what reader am I trying to speak to and how do I want to like get, create a safe space for them to hang out? And then you don't need to wait until your book's done to do that. You can start joining those spaces that are similar to it today. You can create your own community today um, using like very like low slash cheap tools online that most people have access to. So yeah, I'd say the thesis of the book is actually more saying that like every author is a creator, no matter what we do. And um, I think the best traditionally published authors are doing this and certainly the best self-published ones are too. That's super cool. You know, we should do an episode. I mean, maybe you have to get kind of further into the book. I'm not sure where you are editing wise or draft wise, but maybe when you got like that first draft done or when, you know, when you have a lot kind of figured out, we should do a, we should do an episode, put it, put it in the comments below. Do you want an episode about Michael's book? I'm always (laughs) down to answer questions. And if if y'all have anything you would like to see in a book about where, this next wave of publishing is headed. Um, just drop me an email. My email is michael at m evans inked with i n k e d uh, dot com. And always happy to chat about books. Cool. Yeah, I think we should. We should do an episode. Um, How about you? Give me your writer life update, dude. I was just gonna say I have no update. I'm like, what do I even? I don't. I mean, I'm writing poetry per usual. I am. Oh, I officially have um, my classes, though. I because right. you know, for people who don't know, I recently moved to Georgia. Uh, I'm living in Atlanta now, and so um, new teaching position. Uh, so yeah. super exciting! I'm actually going to be working with um, like dual enrollment, so high school students yeah. who are taking college courses for college credit, um, which is what I did. So I have kind of I'm feeling that like personal connection with them already. So. Um, I, my last job, um, there were a lot of students that I did like, but they were mostly students who were there for the sports because they were athletes. Um, 
they didn't prioritize the uh, academic side of college, so it was very difficult to teach those students. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so, so I'm a little bit more excited to, to teach kids, I think, who are really, really there to, to learn, to push themselves. And I mean, I, were, I mean, I do this, I, you know, with the organization. So I'm used to, you know, working with younger people. And I think I have more of a useful energy. So, yeah, I think that's the only update for, for me. Otherwise, just same old trucking along but but yeah i'm i'm excited oh we sh we should announce what we're gonna do so we are going to read i have a um article on my phone from grammarly and it's i think it's like top th like 30 pieces of writing advice um that they have collected actually i should just um pull it up and read it so I can give you so it's the Grammarly blog 30 writing tips to make writing easier so yeah I thought it would be fun for us to go through each one we don't have to do all 30 we can go through each one and you know give our experience on this our thoughts we maybe agree or disagree like hot takes I know <laughs> so and I'm like if, the, if it hasn't shown yet, I'm a pretty opinionated person, so um, I should have opinions on most of these. So yeah, Desiree is like always judging you, just so you know. So Hardcore. If you ever meet her, she's yeah, she's like totally like going, oh my god, I can't believe what they're wearing. Like, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually think you are not that opinionated. Like like you are passionate, and I, I think that that's a better way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. So I'm, I'm, I try to really check my biases to check my, like, I'm not judgmental in the sense where like, I look at someone and I'm like, oh, they messed up their makeup. How dare they? Like, I just, I don't, I think because I don't look about like at those things, I don't really care about those things, but I am a person who is like, because I'm so critical of myself, I am always I am always thinking about like, okay, what is the best thing to do? What's the most efficient thing to do? And what is that? So when it comes yeah. like advice, I usually have an opinion on whether like, is it good advice? Is it bad? Is it helpful? Is it not? So yeah. Well, I'm curious to start hearing your opinions on the advice. So let, let's go to the first one. Okay. Um, and I can read, they each have like a little description so I can read that, but if we need further explanation, I'll do that, but I'll just, I'll just give us the title for each one. So this says set writing goals. Um, I'll read a little bit of this. Maybe you want to write a certain number of words per day or upgrade your vocabulary. You can't reach a goal unless you have one. So write that, write that goal down and work toward it. Mm. I, I agree with this. I, I do. I, I think setting writing goals is really important. And I would just say like to caveat that with a bit more detail, I think it's important to be real with your writing goals. Like, like don't like try and shoot for the moon and, and be disappointed in yourself if you don't hit it. And then I'd say like, we don't always hit our goals, but I was hearing something interesting from someone who worked at uh, Microsoft because they used to have this really toxic team culture but they have a better one now. And I like, I found that interesting. So I want to look into it. And part of what they've done in kind of making a better team culture is say that we set goals that we're going to hit 70% of the time. So mm. it's like intentionally okay to not be hitting your goals because you know, you're challenging yourself, but then know that you can't beat yourself up about that 30% you're not hitting. Yeah. I like that a lot. I think that's something that I've had to, I, I've done two things in my own, just not just my writing goals, but all of my goals. Um, or like my to-do list, I have been, um, instead of making a to-do list, I write a have done list. So I, I just write all the things that I did for the day just to make myself feel more accomplished. I love that. Yeah. It, it's really helping a lot because my to-do list is never realistic. It's like, I think that I'm superhuman. And so I do a have done list. And then on top of that, I make my daily to-do list and I make that and I say that this is what I have to get done for the entire week because that's more realistic. Like 
like for instance, today I was like, okay, well, I got to make sure I do my meetings. I'm going to record podcasts with Michael, but I'm also have to do the dishes and the laundry. I also have to sweep and I also have to make sure I grocery shop. So I put down everything on my list. And then if I don't get it done, I'm like, oh, well, it's fine because I have the whole week to do it. So it's all good. I, I love that. I, I think that's something that other people should co-opt. I actually might want to take that for myself specifically, like the I have done list, because uh, I think it's really easy to beat yourself up when you kind of cross things off your list. And then you're only looking at the things you haven't done. You're like, I haven't done anything because that's what's left. But when you actually look at what you've done, it's like, oh, wait, no, like I, you know, I created that character bio. You may or may not create character bios. It's something I do quite often before I write a story or maybe whatever, or like you have a list of things you have to do as a writer. And, you know, what, all one thing I'll say to that is when you're actually thinking about making your list, it's nice to sometimes have focus because we sometimes like to throw everything in the kitchen sink, speaking of washing the dishes, at our to-do list. We like to think of everything we could possibly get done, but it's sometimes nice to just like clear your plate before you even put it on and just be like, you know what? I don't need that in my life right now. So I think to constantly reflect before you set your goals, really, what are these going to be? Yeah, that's super true. I think the reflection is very important. Um, already disagree with this. I don't know. This says right in the morning. Ooh. For many people, writing comes easier at, right after a good night's sleep. Grammarly's research also shows that early birds make fewer writing mistakes. I feel like that's really subjective. I I get it and I like to write in the morning too, but I also write before bed and I also write when I'm like walking around. So I don't know, that's not, I feel like that's like, if you like to write in the morning, then write in the morning, but I don't think you should have to. Yeah, I agree. Like, it's kind of like when people say like, go to the gym in the morning, you know, like that's kind of like a similar type of, honestly, it's kind of a very, Hopefully we like writing more than going to the gym, but it's very similar in terms of like this habit that's hard to build and that, you know, you see a lot of people doing and doing really well. I'd be like, I'll never get there. But, you know, going to the gym is not even something I ascribe to going to the morning, but it makes logical, like a little bit more sense. Cause it's like, okay, I get going to shower after I go to the gym and then I, you know, like yeah. you're showered and fresh for the day. So like, it makes logical sense to do it in the morning, but like, I don't ever go in the morning, like ever go to the gym in the morning. I'm much more like if I'm like home and like, kind of around during the day. I like to go in the middle of the day um, just to break up my day. And if not, like I like going in the evening, like I'm almost never going in the morning. But when it comes to writing, like I think it's a similar thing for you. Like if you don't want to go in the morning, especially with writing, you don't have to shower after you write. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you do. I have no idea what you're doing while you're writing. <laughs> Won't judge if you do. But, it, you know, writing is something you can plot any time. And I think as well, writers that I've talked to, like, Josie Miller was someone who did this, um, and this was like on the first edition of the Young Year Writers podcast. Throwback, but she was like in high school yeah. writing writing books. But I literally mean in high school. So there would be like five minutes in between class, and that's when she'd take out her phone, get a hundred words in the notes app, and then you know you have you finish a test or an assignment early. You got ten or fifteen minutes during your day. Okay let's let's just write a little bit let's grease those wheels so you don't even need to like set aside time to write you can just find holes in your day you're waiting online in a grocery store maybe you're at the dmv that place is a nightmare you know you those times you can fit it in yeah i agree with that like especially like i i understand having like a specific time every day if you're writing a novel and you're like i have to put in the work but because I write poetry, it just kind of like, it'll hit me just in waves. And so I can't always control when that happens. So yeah, I, I agree with that. This next one says write daily. I, okay, so yes, if you can, but that's sometimes not realistic. And I know that whether you're you know dealing with mental health stuff like when i'm going through like a down mental health period i don't write every day um and or even if like my work is getting really busy like i definitely try to find time to write if i can't or, or if i'm inspired you know just like you said jot down in your notes app but i i I feel like the to be able to sit at least for like an hour or two and write every day, that is a privilege. And if you have it, awesome, do it. But like, know that I just don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's 
for everyone. That would be great if it is, but I mean, I don't know. I don't write every day. So. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. It's one of those things like we sometimes take a best practice and make it a religion. And I think that it is generally best practice to write every day. If you want to be like a really good writer, then like you practice that muscle. And, you know, of course you take off days here and there, but to, to make it a daily routine of sorts. And definitely when I've like been in my best writing, like, you know, I'm getting into writing this nonfiction book now, I actually had to kind of like make a decision where I'm like, I don't have time to write fiction and nonfiction today. Like it just is too much for me. And I'm like, I'm actually kind of let, seeing both suffer if I'm like bouncing back and forth. Like I need to almost stay with doing one of these kind of styles of writing each day. And I'm going to continuously get better at it during this period. But that doesn't also mean I have to write like every day forever. Like during this drafting period, I find it's better for me. But, you know, if that's not how your writing works, like that's okay too. And especially like in the beginning, I think if you're a professional writer who's full time doing this, like, yeah, writing most days makes sense. Like that is kind of your job. But if it's not your job, like there's a lot of things in life that should come first before writing. Like hate to say, even though it's our passions, what we love to do, like just being realistic, like school should probably come before your writing if you're in school, you know, not so that you can't dedicate a lot of time to it, but it should still come first. Your job should come first, your livelihood, your relationships. There's a lot of things that should come first. And and yeah, that hopefully you can weasel that in. And as writing over time, if it becomes more and more of a priority in your life, um, you know, you can do that. But I think there's also a sacrifice to writing every day. And for a lot of people, I don't necessarily know if it's worth that sacrifice. Yeah, I think I think definitely understanding like the difference between are you writing because you're a full time writer or are you writing because it's a career that you are you you know you, I think you can still develop that skill. Um, you know what it is it, really my response for a lot of these is because. I feel the pressure to write every day and everything. So if like you are that type of person, which you might, you might be, if you're listening to this, um, don't let it become a pressure thing. Like don't beat yourself up. If you didn't write today, I think that's the one thing I'm like, life happens. If you couldn't write today, it's okay. Like you got write twice as much tomorrow. You'll be fine. Like, <laughs> I am so with you. And one toxic thing that I know writers do in terms of like goals, kind of going back to that is maybe you set like a goal to hit like 10,000 words each month that you want to do. And I guess you could break that down and see how much you need to get into a week. And and from there, maybe like you only get 6,000 words in one month. So you say next month, I'm going to write 14,000. And you kind of like stack and try and make up for your goals. And I think that can lead you to burnout because you're then trying to catch up to what you feel like you missed. Yeah. And I think that's almost a recipe for disaster. That's a good point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think I just, um, I'm not a big word count person. I I mean, again, I don't write novels, so my experience is a little different. But I think if I were to like tell myself, hey, you got to write four pages every day, I think I'd lose my mind. I think that I would just go crazy because if I didn't hit that every day, In my mind, I'd be like, well, I'm just a failure. I just failed. And it's like, that's not true, but it's it's those expectations we have for ourselves. So that might be the case with a lot of these. Um, This says, get inspired by research. I think I agree with that. I mean, I think research, though, can be could be many things like research could be reading a good book could be like for me, it's having conversations with people or like. Maybe I shouldn't admit this. I'm a big eavesdropper. So I really like to listen in on people's conversations when I'm in public. Um, that's inspiration for me. And that's research. Because I'm like, what does realistic dialogue sound like? You know, so. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of things that could be research. So I, I, I do agree with that. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's a really good point. And I think it's opening yourself up to that, like every moment is kind of a place to learn and, and reflect more in the world. Like Google isn't your only place to research in class or in school isn't your only place to research, you know, life in a way is a practice in, in learning more about the world. And the beauty of writers is that 
you get to always put that into your stories if you choose to. Yeah, that's really true. How powerful. I feel so powerful thinking about that. It's like I can take all of this real life stuff and just put it into my own stories. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Always carry a notebook and pen. I have thoughts. I'll let you go first this time. Um, I think you should always have something around you that you can jot down an idea. That doesn't need to be a notebook and pen. Yeah. I was going to say the exact same thing because, I mean, I think that's what they're getting at. Like, yeah. Like, they're saying yeah. inspiration can hit you at any time. Like, so I totally agree with that. Um, I know there's some debate about, like, you should only write with pen and paper. And then some people are like, well, typing is easy. You should be able to type. And like, but I'm like, if you, as long as you're writing, like, that's all that matters. So I, I always, I'll do my phone if I'm out in public. Huh. I'm with you. I'm with you. The phone for me is the thing that like, oftentimes I have on me now, just in our world nowadays, and that I find easy. But a lot of times I, will write something short down and then reflect on it later. And I think that it's important and healthy as a writer to build in a space of daily reflection into your life that isn't actually like writing your latest work. Mm -hmm. But even if it's just like 15 minutes of like journaling, diary, however you want to call it, of just reflecting on your day of sorts, I, I think it's really important as a human being, but I think it's especially important for writers and I think it'll actually give you more an awareness over what it is that you need to write next. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, you know, I'm getting a flashback, something I used to do. I'm a big journaling person. And so I remember for a period of time, what I did at the end of every day was after my journal entry, I would write a poem based on like what I felt and what happened that day. And so, I mean, it was like such a great way to just decompress. Like it was really... It just felt good. So, yeah, I, I agree. Having something accessible pretty much, uh, especially, like, at the end of the day, really helps. Without a doubt. I So, so with you. Yeah. So this next one, I'm going to stop answering first because I always want to share my thoughts. Um, experiment with writing prompts. What do you think, Michael? Um, I've personally never done that, so I don't like. Uh, again, like it might be a good good thing to do, but I've never been a big writing prop person because I think for me, I get my inspiration and ideas for story structure elsewhere. Mm. But I could see it being a really good thing to do. Yeah. So, so because I write shorter works, I love writing prompts. They're like my favorite thing. They're one of my favorite things to teach and like show people. Oh, hey guys, a little bit of a plug here. Um, every, let me see, see how I work that in? I'm getting good at it. Um, every month, the first Tuesday of every month, I do a workshop with the Charlotte Library um, called Spark Creativity. And basically, you know, we just get together and we do a bunch of writing prompts. So like, And I pick a theme, usually like October's coming up. So for October, I'm going to do... I say coming up, it, when we're recording this, it's like August. But honestly, when this comes out, it might be pretty close to October, the way that we're scheduling, the way we're scheduling videos. We're talking to you guys from like way in the past. Y'all are way in the future at this point. But I pick a theme every time. It's super fun because we'll do like these super fun writing prompts or sometimes we focus on a craft. Like maybe we talk about, um, you know, I don't know, how to write dialogue. And so... I feel like it has always helped me. I think that it's tricky when you write longer works, but I do think writing prompts can really be helpful even when you work on longer works because you can kind of use writing prompts to restructure scenes or practice dialogue or even like put your character in a new situation and see how they would react and like understand your character a little bit more. So, so yeah. I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a writing prompt fan. I'm a writing prompt girly. I'm with you. I'm with you. They sound <laughs> wonderful. This one says outline. I'll read because it sounds a little vague. 
If you often find yourself rambling on without a clear structure, start with an outline. Follow this simple no-fail outline process to order yourself. Okay, so they're like tying in something that they added. I think there's a link with this. Um, okay, outline. Are you an outliner? Yeah, yeah, I definitely am. You know, I think when I first started, I wasn't. And then I realized very quickly what the benefits were, at least for me. And I was like, this is so much better. You know, I would say to anyone who like wants to write like a series, mm -hmm. like if you're a series novel writer, which I am, my, my series are typically like five ish books, we'll say long. I, I think that outlining is pretty necessary because you can re if you write yourself into a corner in a series, um, two or three books in, it can be very difficult to mm -hmm. get out. And if you outline, you might realize that the thing that got you into that corner actually happened 10 chapters earlier. And if you think about it from like a, just a time perspective, you've now potentially wasted like 10 chapters of writing. Like you might have to press delete on all of it. I had to on my first book essentially, because it wasn't very structured. Um, I pressed delete on the whole thing and then wrote a new outline and wrote the whole thing. And I think since then, I've always tried to be like very cautious of like, as a writer, I want people to experience my words and I want to refine it and make it better, but I don't want to just like mm. waste words. Like they're precious. So I think outlining enables me to do that by delivering a clarity of thought ahead of time. And I think it's, it's something that's um, it's been essential, but as I've gotten through a lot of books and I've written over a million words of fiction now, so I'm definitely like, I think you know, been in it a little bit. The, I mean, the real experience writers are over 10 million words. It's crazy. But I'm now outlined enough where my outlines are becoming less robust. And I'm feeling more comfortable with that and having more and more leeway. I always gave myself some leeway um, because I trust myself more and know that, okay, I'm probably not going to write myself into a corner. And giving myself more agency can be a good thing. But you know, it takes a while to get there. And in the beginning, if it's your first book, I think it's it's a very tall order just to sit there and stare at a blank page and write. I think it's much more cheerful to be like, you know, my book's going to be, you know, this is what I want to happen in my book. These are the five mm -hmm. big things. This is the arc. And let's break down these arcs into smaller pieces. Let's break down those smaller pieces into smaller pieces. And then you could like look at it and be like, wait, like I know where this thing's going. I can write. And then you could show it to a friend before... They have to like read a whole book and they could give you feedback on your outline. And I'm not saying a good outline makes a good book. Definitely not. But like, if it's a bad outline, it's probably mm. not. Gonna be so, so talking about outlining, is that kind of more like, you know, planner versus pantser is a planner, a person who's going to use an outline or can a pantser also outline? Pantsers don't typically okay. outline. Um, I mean, there's a spectrum. And I think there's always a healthy medium, but I think that involving some reflection on where the story is going, especially in the beginning, like if you, if you think you're a pantser, especially if you're like kind of in the beginning stage of your writing journey, I would really try and become more of a plotter unless it's like completely impossible and that makes you hate it. But if you can get over that kind of discomfort in the beginning, I think it will help you out. And then you could slowly gravitate more and more towards a pantser as you, again, develop more of your voice, a trust in your story. But it takes a lot of time. And mm. outside of, like, the writing phenoms, like, most of us need to, like, practice. So that's, that's interesting. I don't think this is necessarily what you're saying, but, like, it's it's kind of like you're saying that, like, to be a pantser, you have to maybe be a little bit more experienced. Now, I don't know if that's the case, and I don't want anyone to be mad. I'm not saying anything. If you're a pantser, it's okay. I'm trying to learn how to be more of a pantser. Um, but that's interesting. It's just interesting to think about that, like, it, it actually, like, you, you'd think being a pantser, it's just like, you know, you, you kind of do whatever, and it's like, you know, you're kind of free and it's, but it's like, no, you kind of have to really know where you're, not where your story's going, but, but it actually still takes a lot of skill. Yeah. To be a pantser. Yeah, it does. You have to have really good instinct as a pantser to be able to kind of follow that. And I think that a lot of us, like, 
like don't get me wrong i think a lot of people can write pretty solid first drafts doing like doing this whole enhancing thing i really i really do think that but um you can write a cleaner first draft almost always i think if you're outlining in the beginning i mean down the line it's whatever you're more comfortable with. i mean by the time that like these like you know pro authors who have 50 60 books under their belt you know i i think i think you get to a point where you're just you're kind of you're good whatever process you're comfortable with you have developed those instincts and that plotting ability where you can kind of use both tools whenever you choose but i think in the beginning if you don't have that plotting ability you could be potentially figuring out mistakes in your story structure after putting hundreds of hours of work in rather than just a few hours and i'd rather figure out those mistakes yeah. a few hours in that's good i'm i'm my whole life i'm i'm a planner in, in all aspects of my life i mean so i i think i agree with a lot of what you're saying um oh interesting oh i i should skip a little bit of this actually because this went into now like writing other stuff like this says something about writing emails and professional documents we want more creative writing that's boring. We, <laughs> we just, we just cry when we get an email. I, dude, I, I sometimes I feel that way. Ooh, interesting. Writers don't actually write. What did you right? Do? What do you think? <laughs> this says writing tips to help you to help you sound natural. Now, okay, wait. I'm curious now because they're kind of sectioned off into different things. Um. So it's, it's all kinds of types of writing. Okay, I, I want to read some of these. Let's 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 see. Um, writing tips help you sound natural. Okay. This says don't ramble. Um, we just said write like you talk, but there's a caveat. A caveat: don't ramble. Avoid winding twists and turns, and don't use filler words such as like, really, and you know. Good writing should get to the point and avoid fluff. So that, I feel like these are like general writing tips now that I like read it. Um, but, but I still, I think I still like that for thinking about creative writing. Like, um, yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, words are precious. So if you can say something that can convey the same emotion in less words, then you're you're only opening yourself up to use more words to further that emotion. Yeah. Like I think one of the things I think about a lot in all of my writing um is um I don't remember who I feel like this was writing advice from a professor of mine but a lot of people say it is if you have to use the word very for anything like very smart you should just change that word instead and say something like intelligent like like I think when they're talking about like not using filler words and really getting to the point like I do think about that in I'm pretty much that way in my emails in my poetry in my fiction in everything I'm like just say it just say it plainly put it on the page you can dress it up later you can make it look nice but like don't let your main priority in the drafting process making it, you know, be be fancy. We don't we don't have to try to be fancy in, in the first draft. Um, so that's something like I like that. Like just get to the point. Don't ramble. Don't go on and on about something that you know isn't really significant. Um, just to kind of sound nice. Uh, that's how I feel about it. People might have different thoughts, but but yeah. No, I, I agree. And, you know, when it comes to being fancy as well, I think readers can tell when it feels like you used a thesaurus yeah. to write, like, or the source. Or multiple thesauruses. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. Like, the you can tell when you use that. And I don't think... <laughs> yeah, like, people don't like that, though. People don't like feeling dumb. Like, wait, I don't know what this means. Like, generally, people don't like to feel that way. Now, it's it's interesting to use beautiful, they're called power words you know, that just evoke this emotion mm -hmm. in people, right? And there can be some complex words that are still power words, right? I mean, effervescent kind of is a word that is not like, it's not like third grade vocabulary, but it's something that can evoke things in people. And, and the list goes on, but if you're just using a complicated word, when you can use a word that's actually, uh, you know, simpler, but conveys the same emotion, 
it, it just sounds like you want to feel smart as an author. And I don't think that wins you any points. Yeah. And you know, something that I am, I'm really understanding now and this, and, and, and let me tell you guys, let me tell you, try this. It may change your writing forever. Like you may, I know that's, that's big. Who who knows? Like I'm, I'm over committing here. Like, but one of the things that in my own writing, I started to really think about, I, I have gotten the critique that like my language isn't well developed. So in other words, like my vocabulary is not as vast. And so I've been thinking a lot for like, I feel like the last like two years, I've been thinking about language. And one of the things I realized that it's not always the way it's not always the specific words you use. It's not that I'm choosing the fanciest, most intelligent sounding word. It is that I am using the language that I already know within my vocabulary. I'm using it creatively and I'm reinventing what that word means. Now, that's something that's maybe more common in poetry, but a, a, a classmate of mine, um, a friend just published uh, their poetry collection. I'm reading it. And one of the things I'm noticing is the way that their work um, is, is showing up on the page. Um, let me find a clear way to say this. Sorry, my brain stopped working for like half a second. Um, the way that their poetry really connects with me is that they're using the language that I already know, um, but reinventing it. And that's something that I've really been trying to think about. Like, I don't have to have this fast vocabulary to write well. I can just use the words that I know and just use them in creative ways. So I'll I'll um I'll plug in her book next time. I have it. I just want to make sure I get the title of it right. But next episode I'll make sure that I that'll be part of my update. So so yeah. I love it. I love it. Um I'm thinking we read one more because this has actually been a pretty long episode. Um Let's find, okay, so I'm not going to do this one. I'm just going to say this one, but I think we can both agree to this. Avoid cliches. I feel like that's a, that's a given. Unless you have other thoughts. Yeah, cliches. Well, I would say cliches are cliches for a reason, but um, tropes are maybe slightly different from cliches. And there's some tropes that readers really like and that you may really like as a reader. But like, I think when a trope kind of graduates to becoming cliche, it's no go. But some things that are cliche and that feel cliche to some readers aren't to others. Mm. So like, you know, it's hard to actually make broad generalizations about like what is a cliche. So it's really difficult. But like, I think analyzing your own taste is what's actually like sometimes the most most efficient thing to do. And if, if you kind of look at something like yeah, that sounds cliche. Yeah, maybe like it's raining cats and dogs. Like that's a very cliche thing to to describe the weather. Like no one's gonna read that and be like, "Wow, you're." That's a really creative way of saying it. So maybe maybe figure out a new way to say that. But I don't want to make broad relations about what a cliche yeah. is. I want to leave that. Up One there. thing that is my favorite, I love to do it. I love when people do it is when people flip cliches on their head and basically use the cliche so the reader is expecting you to finish. So it's like if someone was like, it's raining cats and birds and you were like, what? Or like something more, you know, crazier than that. But I love that. That's like my favorite thing. So oh, I... I have one. I found one. Um, this is number 23. This is an interesting one. This will be our last one. Um, and we probably won't do any writing advice at the end of this episode just because it's all writing advice. Um, this says, develop your comma mojo. The comma is a misunderstood punctuation mark. There are many rules for proper comma, us comma usage, but if you study them, they'll become second nature thoughts i just look comma mojo i just i like that a lot does mix the commas sound like a lot right? more fun than they are um i think your your editor will very much appreciate you having a, a good grip on how commas work but you know don't stress about it when you're writing and like a lot of really good writing doesn't even use much commas like it depends on your style, but like Suzanne Collins with Hunger Games kind of like yes. pushed forward the more like punchy 
style of writing, right? Of like shorter sentences, but pack a lot of emotion in it. So it depends on how much commas you want to use. But yeah, generally like being good at grammar is helpful. I'm sure Grammarly is trying to promote their own tool when saying that. But I will say that tools like Grammarly, Pro Writing Aid, a lot of them are very similar. They one offer education discounts and they two can actually be super useful because, you know, when you try and edit your own work, a lot of your editing time can kind of get bogged down and like, oh, let me move this comma. Did I misspell this? Your mental energy is focusing on that. But to actually have a software who comes in and can kind of just identify those errors for you, it can help you edit a lot faster. So you can focus on maybe like the more high level stuff in the story, more of the things that like really matter, like word choice, like we were talking about. So you don't even have to be that good at grammar if you utilize <laughs> right like that sponsoring them um yeah yes i agree with that so i have two things one i love as you brought up the hunger games for people who do not know i love the hunger games and i don't know i never thought i was obsessed with it until i started to bring it up like every time i talked to a writer and then i was like i think i'm obsessed with this um yeah so <laughs> that's the one thing she does like her use of punctuation throughout her novels, Suzanne Collins is phenomenal. But the one thing that I will say to people, for someone who is a college professor and works a lot on helping people um, structure their sentences, don't be afraid of using a period. Don't. Your period sometimes, um, using a period sometimes can be your best friend. So, make sure that you don't use the comma in like replacement of that because it's probably wrong. You don't have to go ham on the comma. I love commas and I, I, I feel like I know how to use them correctly. I'm a big grammar person, but it's okay. You nowadays you can usually use a period for almost anything. So yeah. So anyway, that was um, our episode on our advice on writing advice. So <laughs> Very meta, but also very fun. I had a great time doing this with you, Desiree, as always. And it would be really curious if you all linked in the comments, just maybe writing advice you'd like mm -hmm. us to react to, because we may or may not turn this into a series. Uh, you guys basically yeah. decide. Well, that's it. No plugs today. Um, just follow us on Instagram. So Young Eager Writers, that's one. And then my personal Instagram is Desi B Poetry. D-E-S-I-B Poetry. Michael, what's your Instagram? Uh, at M Evans inked with i-n-k-e-d try to be very i like it yeah i like both of our both of our what are they called tags usernames whatever very good yeah yeah okay that's all goodbye everyone mm -hmm.